patrons were not charged for this video. So in an effort to maintain information integrity and to not fall in the trap of becoming someone who just yells nice sounding slogans to the in-group that they're a part of, I'm going to be appending a video that I made, and that's what this video is. I recently uploaded a video on supply and demand. It was not my best video, I don't think, but it got lots of comments and it got a lot of views at the start. That's just how these things happen, I guess. Many of them were in good faith, though, and criticizing the video, mostly the points I made in the video and the script of the video, with some valid points. Originally, that video was going to be an adaptation of some chapters from Steve Keen's book, Debunking Economics, specifically the first few. I was going to discuss the mathematical problems of supply and demand as they are modeled in mainstream or neoclassical economics. That script ended up being really, really long, like three hours long, so I decided to cut it down. I always end up writing long, and I just went at it with a hacksaw, basically. I didn't want to just plagiarize Keen's work either, which I felt I was doing, so I just removed all of those parts. And in my head, I had cut everything out except an introduction to supply and demand in their most basic form of uh, what's often called the Marshallian cross, where it's just two intersecting lines. And I had also set up future critiques if I ever wanted to return to supply and demand uh, and explain what Keen explained. But after working on it for so long, I think I was just lost in the sauce. The video that I ended up making was basically a 30 minute rant with 10 minutes of econ. There was basically no setup for anything else, very little explanation, and it wasn't a complete argument. But I do stand by basically everything that I said in that video. So in an effort to correct those mistakes and address a lot of the points that were raised, I'm going to be putting a more formal sequel video out, which is this one. Again, this won't be one that I charge patrons for, and it's not going to be the typical style much lower production values. It's going to basically be a presentation of slides. I'm also not going to be putting any screenshots of comments from the previous video in, and I'm not going to be responding to any specific comments. I don't want it to be a response video. It's an improvement to what I made. It's actually free to do updates uh, to work that you made on the internet, which is something people usually uh, don't do. I don't know why. Um, any criticisms of my stances and arguments after this video comes out can now be made fully because I would no longer be putting up half of my stance on what's actually a very large topic. Also, all of the real work I'm getting from Keen. Of course, full credit to him, his book, and his work, and hopefully I don't misrepresent him or this work. Lastly, I'm not a spokesperson for Keen. I've never met him. I've never studied with him. We also disagree on the labor theory of value. What I express here are the understandings that I have of the topics that Keen has covered in his book. So I didn't do this research myself. All right, with all that out of the way, let's do a brief outline of the video. To start, I'm going to summarize the previous video, going over why we can't assume that supply and demand as relationships themselves exist on their own. It's non-falsifiable, which is a really big deal in science. Things need to be able to be falsified. There needs to be something else to supply and demand. I'm then going to cover the mathematical problems with the market supply in mainstream economics, what they've done to make a supply curve, and then also the mathematical problems with the market demand curve in mainstream economics. Supply has much simpler math, so I want to get that out of the way first. And in short, the mainstream models of supply and demand say that the equations for both supply and demand are actually just aggregations or approximations of what are actually underlying individual supply and demand curves for firms and consumers, respectively. If this is able to be done, then it solves the problem of non-falsifiability. You can actually say, okay, well, we know how each of these individual people are going to behave, and so in the aggregate, if they behave or don't behave that way, you can think of an observation that would falsify it. That's what falsifiability is. You can think of an observation where the theory could be wrong, unlike the previous supply and demand thing. So with that out of the way, let's go to the recap. First, the basic two lines intersecting version of supply and demand, that's a simplification of the work of a guy called Marshall. He's an economist. He's not one of the names that's thrown around. It seems like names in econ last for maybe 50 years and then they're replaced by some new guy. He's not usually taught anymore, but he was the one who first formulated the modern conception of the idea of supply and demand curves interacting. And specifically, he said, you don't need anything other than these curves to explain prices. This all sort of started with him. 
I'm not going to be presenting his original paper here verbatim, but the link to it, if you want to read it, is on screen. I'm going to be presenting his theory in other words. Think of this as sort of a slide deck that a professor would be giving, and all of the things that I reference are sort of the required reading beforehand. I'm structuring this similar to the works that it's based on. So I do highly encourage you to go read these original works yourself, but I'm not trying to plagiarize them or say that I came up with this. Anyway, Marshall's really simplified model says that you have a relationship between the price of a good and how much is going to be offered for sale. This is the supply curve. He also says that there's going to be a relationship between the price of a good and how much will be demanded. This is the demand curve. The simplest possible relationship that could exist for either of these is a linear one. You can have other polynomials such as quadratic or cubic or other things, but the simplest one is linear. Let's look at the supply curve. We'll assume that it starts at zero, zero because if you make zero dollars from selling something, then probably no one will want to supply it. So all we need is one coefficient. I'm going to call it A. So price and quantity are related by multiplying by this coefficient A to get the other, or dividing if you do it the other way around. If we could observe the points on this line, we could get an estimate of A. But how would we actually observe these points? The answer is that we can't. We could maybe survey people on Earth to find out how much bread they would offer up for sale if the price was $4 a loaf. Sure, that's possible, but that's not an observation of what the supply curve is capturing. The supply curve is measuring what would happen, not what people want to happen or wish would happen. The actual supply that would be given to the market is governed by real-world factors, whether they have an oven or flour, time to bake bread, etc. Marshall agrees with this because he says that what actually gets observed in the real world is where this supply curve intersects the demand curve. All of the other points here are, by definition, something that doesn't happen. They just reflect what would happen if things were different, so you can't get it by surveying. So our only hope here is to observe reality, where things actually get produced and supplied. That means we have to look where the curves intersect. We can't get observations otherwise. So that means we need a demand side. It doesn't make sense to assume that demand starts at zero, zero, so we're going to need at least an intercept. And again, I'm going to assume it's linear, so we're going to have another coefficient as well. Let's call the intercept C and the slope B. For the same reason as before, we also can't observe any of the points on the demand curve. As a simple example, do you right now want some bars of gold? Yeah, everyone does. But that's not the demand for bars of gold, because the demand is how much we'll actually get bought at a given price. So we can't actually observe any of the points on the demand curve without actually seeing what has changed hands. You could say, though, that these curves represent what people want to do, but then the curves lose meaning because people's wants are independent of price. What we want is what actually happens in real life, and what we're actually saying is that price governs the quantities of exchange that happen in real life. Hence the problem. We have two equations and three unknowns. We cannot solve this. Even if we get another observation from, say, another day in the market, we're again faced with two new equations because we don't have a way of knowing which of the curves has moved. And say we have a whole collection of these market points and we decide, okay, you know what? Let's do a linear regression on all of these. What that gives you is a line that's meaningless. It's not totally meaningless, because what it actually is, is it's sort of akin to a weighted average of both the supply and the demand curves and how they've changed. So we need something else. And this problem was actually realized within the field of mainstream economics. They knew that there were problems with Marshall's simple model. So what they do is they say, okay, we're going to look at each side of the market, the supply side and the demand side. They say that these are both aggregations of individuals. Now, I use the term individual here, but usually economics textbooks will use the term households or firms or something. This is a distinction without a difference. The household and firm are assumed to be single units which purchase and consume entirely internally. There are no underlying mechanisms that affect the market for the sake of mainstream economic modeling. So effectively, it's an individual. It's just semantics. Call them whatever you want. The constituent units that we're going to aggregate together the behaviors of in some way to get market outcomes. I'm calling them individuals. 
They model these individuals using something that's basically equivalent to the agents in a branch of mathematics, which is called game theory. They are rational utility maximizers. I have actually covered how poorly this model fits actual humans, but that's beside the point. Just suffice it to say that you can't actually produce the equations by which these agents would operate for basically all human beings. But anyway, these agents are given a scenario where they have a limited budget and then get benefits from doing certain things with that budget. For the supply side, this is choosing how much to produce and sell, and for the demand side, it's choosing how much to buy. In both cases, though, it's important to remember that they are making a trade-off between two goods, the commodity being bought and also the money used to buy it. Sometimes, though, instead of money, they have two commodities. Neoclassical and mainstream economics like to try to get rid of money wherever it's possible to keep things real, commendable, but whether you want to do it or not, it doesn't make a difference. We're going to do demand. Remember that to have a demand curve, we need to build up from something else, specifically individual consumers. That's usually what someone on the demand side is called. The overall goal that we're trying to do is to get a market demand curve that obeys something called the law of demand. The law of demand means that no matter what, as price increases, the quantity demanded is going to decrease. This is very important. We can't have a spot where price increases cause quantity increases, because then there wouldn't be a unique quantity demanded for every given level of price. Here's an example where there's a cubic demand function for those who are more familiar with math. All that that means is that there's a local peak here, a local minimum here, and the curve forms a sort of sideways S. If you look at this price, in fact, this range of prices, there isn't a unique quantity that's being demanded. There are multiple. And this is really problematic because now our theory doesn't give one prediction for what would happen in the real world. So we need a function that continuously goes down. That's what's called the law of demand. And what we're after is figuring out how to get individuals to have some specific preferences or some specific behaviors that would let us aggregate all of their behaviors into a market demand curve, into a collective behavior that obeys the law of demand. What are the conditions under which we can get all of these individuals to ensure that we get a market demand curve that obeys the law of demand? That's what we're after, that's the big goal. This way, we can base the market demand curve on observable individual habits. What we can and will do is construct individual demand curves for each of these people, and then we will try and aggregate those to get a curve for the whole market. This entire group of distinct individuals with distinct preferences and behaviors will then have their collective behavior described by an equation called the market demand curve. Again, I use the term individual, but usually economists use households. It's a distinction without a difference. Call it whatever you want. Now, we're going to cover a lot of topics in this side. It's pretty mathematically intense, and it's going to basically be a microeconomics 101 crash course, but I'm going to introduce them here in a list so that it's not too overwhelming. First, we're going to be working with the tools of marginalism and utility, and marginal utility. Marginalism is this framework sort of philosophy where we can model human behavior. Decisions are said to be made, quote, at the margin, unquote. In short, we just assume that decisions are being made based not on totals, but on the changes at each specific point. You'll see what I mean later. Second, I'll introduce something called an indifference curve. Indifference curves show combinations of two different things, which give someone the same amount of utility. They like them the same amount. Third, I'll be demonstrating a budget constraint. We're going to add this to the indifference curves, and I'm going to also explain what this means in the sort of abstract model. It's basically a trade-off between distinct commodities. And this is going to be what lets us get individual demand curves. Also, as a bonus, the budget constraint is also modelable using dialectics, but that's not important. Fourth, we're going to go over how changing the price has two different effects on individual demand. These are called the income effect and the substitution effect. And then we're going to make something called a Hicksian compensated demand curve. Fifth, we're going to discuss angle curves. 
the less cool angle in economics, sadly. These are sort of the brother to demand curves. Instead of relating price and quantity, they're going to relate income and consumption habits. Sixth, we'll show that to get the demand of two people, you can't simply add their individual demand curves together. This goes back to us having to do Hicksian compensation, but this is where the trouble starts. We'll finally go over how people figured out to combine the individual demand curves, how that was a major breakthrough in economics, but how actually it was a proof by contradiction that you can't get a market demand curve. Specifically, to get a market demand curve from individual demand curves, you need there to be distinct individuals, specifically individuals with distinct behaviors. You can't have them be linear combinations of each other using mathematical speak. Just think of it this way. If two consumers have exactly the same behavior, you could just combine them to get one consumer. And if you can combine consumers, then you could cut a consumer into two new consumers. So then we're back where we started. A market demand curve could be made by just making an individual demand curve and saying it actually represents a thousand people. So we have to have individuals with distinct preferences. And we need to figure out a way of aggregating those distinct preferences to get a demand curve that slopes down. As a spoiler though, it turns out that the conditions under which you get a market demand curve require individuals to not have distinct preferences. I'll say that in a different way. What we find is that to have a demand curve, there can't be more than one person. It's a falsification of the idea that you can start with individuals and get market demand curves. And finally, a reminder that most of what I'm saying here is an adaptation of the first few chapters of Steve Keen's book, Debunking Economics. I think getting accurate information out there to append my previous video is very important, and I don't want to delay that process. So instead of doing a complete rewrite and coming up with my own very unique way of saying all the stuff that's in there, think of this as basically lecture slides, and the textbook is Steve Keen's. With that out of the way, let's start with number one, marginalism and utility. Marginalism is a philosophy of the idealist or dualist metaphysics. That's also not important right now, but I think it's a little important to note, at least. It gets its start, in the modern form at least, with a guy called Jeremy Bentham, and his principle that all human behavior is basically reducible to a single dimension, the pain and pleasure dimension. Unlike other fields of study that say human desires and actions have many distinct and irreducible dimensions, Utility and marginalism say that there's just one, the pain and pleasure dimension. Usually this is simplified to just the pleasure dimension. I think sharing a quote from Bentham is worthwhile here because it shows where mainstream economists get their ideas from, and also specifically what they're trying to model with math. Bentham makes what are essentially assertions, and then mainstream economics and neoclassical economics have been trying to turn those into more formal theories and see how well they describe the world. This is the worldview that I so often critique, that basically all of humanity, the whole human experience, can be reduced to a single dimension, and oh, isn't it oh so convenient that you can also measure it in dollars. But Usually economists call these units of pain or pleasure utils, short for utility. Marginalism is a sort of modification of this concept that Bentham came up with. He's actually the one to call it utility. But let's get to the quote. Nature has placed mankind under the governance of two sovereign masters, pain and pleasure. They govern us in all that we do, in all we say, in all we think. Every effort we can make to throw off our subjection will serve but to demonstrate and confirm it. In a word, a man may pretend to abjure their empire, but in reality, he will remain subject to it all the while. The community is a fictitious body, composed of the individual persons who are considered as constituting, as it were, its members. The interest of the community, then, is what? The sum of the interests of the several members who compose it. It is in vain to talk of the interest of the community without understanding what is the interest of the individual. An action then may be said to be conformable to the principle of utility when the tendency it has to augment the happiness of the community is greater than any it has to diminish it. So it should be pretty clear just how influential Bentham's philosophy has been in economics. Fun fact, at his request, he was taxidermied after he died and then put on display where he remains to this day. 
Tom Scott actually did a video on him, and that kind of means that there are two pioneering economists and philosophers who were taxidermied and then put on display after they died. The other one is Lenin. I'm going to quote Keane here directly, and apologies for the back-to-back -back quotes. Bentham's statement that, quote, the community is a fictitious body, the interest of the community then is the sum of the interests of the several members who compose it, is no more than an assertion. To turn this into a theory, economists had to achieve two tasks, to express Bentham's analysis mathematically and to establish mathematically that it was possible to derive social utility by aggregating individual utility. So the goal of mainstream econ in these early years was to take Bentham's philosophy and then try to model it mathematically. This happens in every field of science, by the way. There's nothing inherently wrong with it. Basically, every field of science has this pioneer who sets forth basically the first principles, as it were, and then they go from there doing their work. Marginal utility is what I'm going to call this framework or method that they've come up with. It will be familiar to anyone who's studied economics before, particularly microeconomics. It's just the sort of thing that every economist assumes that all the agents act as. Even the fact that there are agents is part of this. First off, there's a thing called utility. Its units are called utils. Utility is a number measured in utils. Specifically, it's a cardinal number. That's a fancy word, but all that it means is, for example, 4 is twice as much as 2, 80 is twice as much as 40, and so on. It means there's a consistent scale here. Sometimes you'll see utility without cardinality. That's called ordinality. That just means there's an ordinal ranking to things. It doesn't require cardinality. For example, when you rate movies from a scale of 1 to 10, it doesn't mean that a movie that's 10 out of 10 is twice as good as a movie that's 5 out of 10, or 3.333 times as good as a movie that's 3 out of 10. Coming first place in a race doesn't mean that you're like half as bad as the person in second, etc. That's ordinality, but utility for us is cardinal. Okay, so let's assume we have a person and some bread. We can keep track of how many utils a person gets from having various amounts of bread. Maybe, for example, it could be linear. They always get two more utils from having another loaf of bread. More likely, though, they get less and less additional utils the more bread that they have. Here's an example of that. With one loaf, they have eight utils. With two, they have 14. With three, they have 18. With four, they have 20. You can see that while each additional loaf of bread does give them more utils, the amount of the increase goes down. This is what's called the law of diminishing marginal utility. Here's a nice graph to show this. Marginal means that we're not looking at the total, but the change from the previous. Marginal is just a fancy word that here means change, or if you're more math inclined, it's the derivative given at this point. Usually, this law of diminishing marginal utility is assumed for all goods. And I also don't really have a problem with that. I think it's hard to find something that you don't sort of value less the more you already have. Maybe immaterial things like love and friends, but those aren't bought and sold, so it's irrelevant for economic discussion. We've gotten marginalism and utility out of the way. Now on to number two, the indifference curve. So we had this nice graph showing the utils from different amounts of bread. Well, what if we had another good? Maybe it's milk. Here's a table showing how many utils that this same person gets from milk. With one liter, they have 27. With two, they have 36. With three, they have 39. And with four, they have 40. Now, let's make a chart where we show the total utility from different combinations of these two things. Maybe they have, for example, two loaves of bread and one liter of milk. For this simple example, I've just added the two utilities together. So the utility of two loaves of bread and one liter of milk is 27 plus 14, or 41 utils. But you can imagine that maybe different combinations are better than others, or that you could have actually any equation where you combine these goods to get utilities. I'm going to keep this one simple, though. Let's also take advantage of this idea that we can have an equation to move from these discrete units to continuous units. So instead of these bars, we get a 3D hill. This means we can purchase any fractional combination or even irrational combination. Basically, we can purchase or have and assign a utility to any number of these things. We could have one and a half loaves of bread. We could have pi liters of milk. They're all included in here. Okay, so now time to introduce the indifference curve. 
it's not actually that complicated. You know how when you look at a mountain, there are all these twists and turns of the valleys and the cliffs and things? Well, now imagine that you've got one of those maps where the rings show the elevation of such a complicated mountain. Every point on one of those elevation lines is the same height. Well, an indifference curve is that same idea, but for the utility mountain. Every point on an indifference curve has the same utility. It's the same height on this 3D mountain that we just made. The person is indifferent between any of those options because they all give the same utility, hence an indifference curve. Now, our indifference curves won't be that complicated like mountains because we're going to assume diminishing marginal utility. In fact, our indifference curves will basically always be the same shape. They're going to be convex relative to the origin. So if we want, we can make the same type of map as the mountain elevation map. We have these lines at some specific heights, and all the points on them are the same utility. But remember, we always increase as we go up or to the right. So any indifference curve further from 0, 0 is going to be higher up in 3D, meaning that it's better. It's a higher utility. Once we introduce a budget constraint that this person can spend on these goods, then we make a demand curve. So let's do that now. The budget here can be thought of in a few ways. It could be that there are prices for these goods given in a money unit like dollars. This person could then be given an endowment or an income in dollars and then spends all of their income purchasing things. The other equally valid way of thinking about it, they're mathematically equivalent, is that they're given some sort of initial income of these goods themselves and the prices are expressed in terms of each other. The reason they're mathematically equivalent, and to maybe understand this a little better, is that if the price of bread is, say, $2, and the price of milk is $1, then you could also say that the price of bread is 2 liters of milk. You see how these are equally valid. You can assume that there's another thing called money, or you can keep it to just these two commodities. I'm going to keep it to just the two commodities, because that makes things simpler. If you assume money, you're technically modeling three commodities. You could replace one of these with money if you wanted to, but the standard way it's taught is to have two real commodities here and not talk in terms of money. All right, so how do we put a budget in here? Well, let's assume that the price of bread is $2, that the price of a liter of milk is $1, and that they have $20 to spend. Let's plot their budget, assuming that they spend all of their money. If they buy zero loaves of bread, they'll have spent all of their $20 buying milk. Well, since milk is $1, they can buy 20 liters of milk. So the point on their budget is here. Then, using the ratio of the two prices, we can begin to construct a line where they buy combinations of things, going all the way until they spend all of their money on bread and none of it on milk. This is the budget line. Now, the fun part of this is that this budget line is on that mountain of utility, so it's got high points and low points. And at some point, there's a point on this budget constraint, which is what it's normally called, which is the highest, the highest utility that this person can afford. Now, obviously, this person is going to pick that position that gives them the highest utility, but how do we find it? Well, it's actually simpler to look at our 2D graph. Here's the intuition. This indifference curve crosses the budget in two places, so obviously it can't be the peak. There's going to be a single peak because we set up indifference curves such that they're always of a certain shape. If we keep moving up and up to higher indifference curves, or in 2D further and further out away from the origin, one of them eventually touches at exactly one spot. This is the highest utility indifference curve that the person can afford to purchase a bundle on. So that point where they cross is the combination the person buys. If you're into calculus, this is actually the point where the slopes match, and that's how you find it using calculus or algebra or whatever you want. If you're into geometry, this is called the point of tangency. But more importantly, we now have a price and quantity. Now, if you imagine us adjusting the price, then this budget line is going to have a different slope. And with that different slope, it changes which indifference curve is now the highest. So if we pick a new price for one of these goods, then we get another price quantity pair. So for each price, we get a quantity demanded for this individual person, meaning we get our individual demand curve. 
If this is a little complicated because we haven't actually graphed dollars here, just imagine that, say, bread is the unit of currency. It's bread dollars. Or you could replace bread entirely and say that this is just the market for milk and we're purchasing in dollars. The line that connects these is the individual's demand curve. There is one caveat, though. We can actually have demand curves for individuals that behave strangely. If our indifference curves looked like this, for example, well, they're still obeying the law of diminishing marginal utility, but look what happens as we decrease price. The amount purchased actually also decreases? How can that be? Well, we cover that in part four. I'll start by quoting Keen here because I think he explains it well. The fact that a fall in price actually lets you consume more of everything can mean that it's possible for the demand curve for a given good to slope upwards at some points. This anomaly occurs because when the price of a commodity falls, the consumer's real income, in effect, increases. The increase in overall well-being, due to the price of a commodity falling, is known as the income effect. Said in another way, remember that we spend our whole budget. Well, if the price of one of the goods goes down, then no matter what, we can afford more. Thus, there's actually two things going on here. The effect of the prices relative to each other changing, which we call the substitution effect, and also the effect that our money now goes further. This is called the income effect. Think about it this way. As inflation goes up, that means the price of everything increases, or it could just be that the price of a subset increases. So now you're spending more money trying to buy the same basket of things or same grouping of things. But also if only some things get more expensive, now the ratio of the prices between them changes and you might start purchasing different things. Now it's the substitution effect, not the income effect that economists are actually after here. They also assume that the substitution effect is always going to be negative. As price increases, consumption of that thing falls. So what we want to do is isolate it. We do this by adjusting their budget line at each of the prices so that the utility they get remains the same. In theory, this means that all of these new combinations that we observe are measuring only the effect of the relative changes in price, not the increase in purchasing power that they also cause. If you think the reasons for doing this are strange, I agree. In effect, they didn't like that you could get different types of demand curves here because they need one that obeys the law of demand. So they looked for a subset of situations where they can make a demand curve obey the law of demand. However, doing this thing where we try to compensate them by keeping their utility the same to always ensure that we're only looking at the substitution effect is moving things away from a more observable situation that we can actually measure and getting, in my opinion, needlessly abstract. This is already an issue. Because how are we going to measure this person's utility to keep it constant so that we can construct this other situation? Regardless, we're going to do it. If you keep utility constant and see how the change in price affects things, what you're actually doing is rotating the budget around the indifference curve that it initially touched until the slope matches the new ratio of prices. The demand curve that you get by doing this each time the price changes is called the Hicksian Compensated Demand Curve. It's also never actually observable because it relies on somehow knowing the indifference curve of the person. The only thing we would actually observe in real life when looking at individuals is the non-compensated demand curve. Only in the world of pencil and paper and made-up examples can we actually get this compensated demand curve. So why do it at all? Well, most people do it just because they were taught to do it, that's how humans operate, but the reason that they did it, again, is because they want a downward sloping demand curve. And the default one that you get without doing this doesn't necessarily slope down. Now, most economics textbooks stop here. Because look, we've got an individual demand curve that obeys the law of demand, what else do we need to do? Well, we need to get a market demand curve. But usually what happens is that the chapter ends with this part, getting an individual demand curve, and then in the next chapter, it's just sort of assumed that we have a market one. But you can't just go from individual demand curves to market demand curves. I'm going to explain that part, but first we need to take a quick detour into angle curves. Angle curves are like the brother to demand curves. Demand curves relate quantity and price. Angle curves relate quantity with income. 
Specifically, they show how the relative consumption of one good changes as income changes. Usually this is relative to all other goods. You could also say that angle curves show how the composition of the basket that you buy changes as your income changes. You can get angle curves by directly connecting the dots on indifference curves at different budget constraints, but only if the budgets change the income and not the price. Graphically, this means that the budget line is always going to be parallel to where it originally was. It's just going to move in and out relative to the origin. There are four types of angle curve that we can get. Maybe as income increases, the amount of a commodity represents a smaller and smaller portion of what you buy in total. This is called a necessity. Bread, milk, clothing of a basic sort, they're pretty obvious. You could also have commodities that, as our income increases, we spend more and more of a portion of our income on them. These are called luxuries. Jewelry, Warhammer 40k miniatures, things like this. There are also things called inferior goods. These are not only goods where you spend a smaller portion of your income on them as you get richer, but you may actually buy less of them overall. Off-brand toilet paper, for example. Not only does that make up a smaller portion of what you spend your money on, you may actually be buying less of it overall. So those are three of the possible angle curves, and I said there were four. Well, the fourth one is that simply as you get richer, you spend the same portion of your income on something. Those are called neutral goods. And remember here, I'm not referring to the same amount of money being spent on them. Those are called necessities. Spending the same amount as your total income increases means that the proportion of money you spent gets smaller. A neutral good is one where you spend the same proportion of your income on it, no matter how rich you are. These simply don't exist. In fact, I would really like if someone could name an example where a homeless person and a millionaire spend the same share of their income on it. Like, what is something that a family living below the poverty line, making $20,000 a year, will spend $2,000 on, and that a millionaire will spend $100,000 on? And you might think, okay, maybe cars? right? Because people buy more expensive cars. But no, it has to be the same commodity, not the same category of commodity. It's not like a millionaire is going to buy 50 used 2000 Toyota Corollas and that a single mom buys one 250th of a Rolls Royce Phantom. That's not how it works. But aside from this, neutral goods, sometimes called homothetic goods, cause another problem. Because they are effectively always consumed in the same proportion as another good, they're basically a single good combined. For example, there's no reason to split up the cheese packet from the noodles in a box of Kraft mac and cheese. They're a single commodity. They're always bought in the same ratio. Goods can be non-linearly combined as income changes, or otherwise, they're mathematically identical to being a single unified combined good. This reasoning is also, like we went over earlier, the reason that people can't have identical preferences they would be mathematically an individual. If we can combine two individuals to get one, we can split one up to get two. If we have two commodities that are always consumed in identical proportions, then we could split them up into an infinite number of commodities. We're looking for where things can't happen that way, where there aren't linear combinations of things. So with all of that out of the way, with angle curves, indifference curves, budget constraints, demand curves, and compensated demand curves, now, let's get to the meat of it. We want to make a market demand curve that obeys the law of demand by aggregating up individual demand curves. And this is where I'm going to go over where the proof by contradiction is. So in recap, we have the law of demand. We need the law of demand, which states that as price rises, quantity falls, because if at any point along the demand curve, there's a point where price rises and quantity rises, then there isn't a unique quantity demanded for a given price on the demand curve. This would mean that in reality, the same group of people are somehow demanding two different levels of something. We can't have that. We need the law of demand to be true. We have found that, okay, for individuals, we can ensure this happens by making Hicksian compensated demand curves, because their normal demand curves may not necessarily obey this. But okay, can we combine these Hicksian compensated demand curves to get a market demand curve that also obeys the law of demand? 
you might think, oh, well, sure, we can't just combine any demand curves because you could easily think of a situation where in aggregate, the total of everything that they demand may go up at some points and down at others. But how would that make sense if all of them are always decreasing? Well, it's because we can't simply add compensated demand curves together. The reason is you can't make compensated demand curves when you're dealing with more than one person. Remember how to get the compensated demand curve, we had to split up how a change in price affects things into two sub-effects, the income effect and the substitution effect. We did that because depending on the underlying utility function that someone has, one of the effects might be stronger than the other. For example, maybe a decrease in the price by a dollar makes us buy five more of it because of the substitution effect, but also buy three less of it because of the income effect. Our income is partially defined by how many of that thing we can buy. So overall, the change would be that we buy two more. But just as easily, we could have utilities that give a situation where the price decreasing by $1 means that the income effect outweighs the substitution effect and we actually buy less. Depending on the utility functions, we can have price decreases causing more or less to be demanded. What we did was we fixed the income effect to be zero and then constructed a demand curve by only having the substitution effect. What we did was we said, okay, we're going to eliminate the income effect by adjusting the budget constraint only around an indifference curve. This means we're only getting the substitution effect. And we're ensuring that individual demand curves obey the law of demand because of this. So what's the problem? Why can't we just add up the compensated demand curves? Well, because first we need to construct them. And constructing them, remember, required us to remove the income effect from the substitution effect. This is possible with just one person, but it's not possible with two people. Because when there are multiple people, the income that someone gets comes from selling to someone else. The relative incomes matter in this situation. In the individual case, we were able to sort of ignore this because we could adjust everything out in the wild in a sense because we only cared about what happened to the individual. But now that we're including all of the other individuals, even if it's just one, we can't. They're intricately tied to each other. Adjusting one means we're also adjusting the other. We can't remove the income effect that comes from changing prices because changing prices means that income changes. You can actually go through and do the math to figure out how to do this sort of compensation to combine these demand curves. What you get are something called the Sonnenschein mantle de Bru conditions. This is something that you'll cover if you ever get a PhD in mainstream economics. The result is basically saying that mainstream economics is not a viable path, that you can't use marginal utility to get a demand curve, but that's not how it's ever reported. What the SMD conditions show is that even when you have individual demand curves, obeying the law of demand, because of how you have to combine them, because of this necessary interplay where you can't separate the substitution and income effects when you're dealing with everyone all at the same time, the demand curve can take any shape, even if all the curves are downward sloping. You can't get a market demand curve to obey the law of demand even when starting with individual demand curves that do. And actually, this result was found before Sonnenschein, Mantel, and Debreu by an economist called William Grauman in 1953. But what Grauman and Sonnenschein, Mantel, and Debreu also found were the specific conditions under which you can get market demand curves to obey the law of demand. Although you can't ensure that you get them, the result said that you can get a market demand curve that obeys the law of demand, but not from just any old set of downward sloping individual demand curves. This is actually where the proof by contradiction is, and none of them actually noticed it. So, okay, what are the conditions? We've come a really long way. We've constructed individual demand curves that obey the law of demand. We want market demand curves that obey the law of demand. And it seems like a big subset of all the possible preferences that people can have will actually let us do mainstream economics the way that we want to. As long as we follow these two conditions. Well, first, all consumers need preferences that make their angle curves straight lines. Second, the angle curves also have to all be parallel to each other. Grauman put it this way, we will show that there is just one community indifference locus through each point if and only if the angle curves for different individuals at the same price are parallel straight lines. 
He's using other jargon there. But okay, what am I saying is wrong with this? Well, first off, we know that there are basically no goods that have straight angle curves. Those were called neutral goods. And remember, it's kind of impossible to even find them. So for the model that mainstream economics is trying to build, it can't even be used for luxuries, necessities, gift and goods, basically every single commodity that actually exists in the real world. Grumman actually thinks this is reasonable. Quote, the necessary and sufficient condition quoted above is intuitively reasonable. It says, in effect, that an extra unit of purchasing power should be spent in the same way no matter to whom it is given, unquote. I'm sorry, what? Like, literally, what the fuck? He's saying that if Bill Gates gets $100, or if you, you watching this video right now, get $100, then you'll both spend it on exactly the same combinations of goods. Get the fuck out of here. But okay, that's not the worst part of it. Not only do they, as Keene quotes it, prove a general law of demand did not apply to the level of the market, look for conditions under which it would apply, and then assumed that those conditions applied to all markets. Instead, they actually missed that they disproved what they wanted to prove to begin with. So the preferences have to produce straight line angle curves for all the individuals. We just went over that. But the second part says that the angle curves also have to be parallel. That's a major problem, because all the angle curves start at 0, 0. Two lines that are parallel and pass through the same point are the same line. And because angle curves measure proportions of goods, that means that each of these consumers buys the exact same proportion of goods as income changes, meaning that they must have identical preferences, meaning they're not different consumers. Mainstream economists proved twice that if you want to start at individuals and get a market demand curve, you have to first assume that there are no separate individuals. The only conditions under which a marginal utility maximizing group of people have habits describable by demand is when there's just a single person. But for a market, we assumed that there would be multiple people. It's a proof by contradiction. So there are three options for what happened here. One, maybe everyone is wrong, right? Maybe all this math is just incorrect. I highly doubt it. Everyone with a PhD in economics knows about the SMD conditions. So the other option is that mainstream economists just simply didn't realize that this was a proof by contradiction. In which case, mainstream economics is so cloistered and such a circle jerk that it should basically be ignored. The result happened twice and was published in mainstream journals, and yet nothing has changed in mainstream economics. So obviously, they're at least not rigorous enough with any of the new information that comes out. Second is that mainstream economists maybe just ignored it to save their ideology, which is also obviously bad, but I don't think that's what happened. Third, and what I personally believe, is that they were so blinded by their ideology, like any one of us could be, that they misinterpreted what they saw and what their results were. Again, this happens all the time. People very often read something that isn't there. This, again, is what I think is most likely. It happens to everyone. We're not computers constantly checking our internal databases for logical inconsistencies. Either way, though, supply and demand theory is bullshit. There's no other way to put it. And I spent hours of my life talking about how it's bullshit. I spent my entire life attending the nation's most prestigious schools to talk about bullshit like this. I'm really just happy to be on TV. Supply and demand theory is bullshit. Stop believing it. Even the most complicated mathematical versions with elasticities and angle curves and marginal utility maximization can't possibly come up with a way to save it. There is no way to say that prices come from only preferences and quantities. There has to be something else going on. There is not a mathematical way of modeling it for that to be the case. And that idea, at the start, was pretty dubious to begin with, because economies make and produce real, limited things that take labor and time and energy to create. It's not just a video game with arbitrary numbers. There are real physical constraints going on, real physical needs to do those things. Death to supply and demand. Put the nail in the coffin. <laughs>